Jola and I are going to discuss some highlights from EAN um, with a focus on drug safety. Um, so we went to a few different poster sessions and presentations um, and some aspects of drug safety were covered. Um, so I'll start off with a poster that I saw um, whilst I was um, attending the virtual conference, which was to do with um, the safety of alemtuzumab. Um, so this was presented by uh, Professor Cole's team from Cambridge looking at autoimmunity on alemtuzumab. Um, it specifically looked back over, um, um, uh, over nine years worth of data of people that are on alemtuzumab um, and investigating the relationship between um, pre-existing autoimmune disease and the development of autoimmune side effects. Um, and essentially they looked at um, the medical history of everyone to see if they had any pre-existing autoimmune disease um, and it turned out that was about 8% of patients that did. And then it looked um, at whether they then went on, have, had a higher incidence of developing autoimmunity on alentuzumab, which I thought was quite interesting. And the conclusion was that there wasn't any relationship. So <laughs> it, was, it was interesting to look at, but it, it showed that basically having autoimmune disease as a at baseline did not predict development of autoimmunity on, on alentuzumab. And they looked specifically at a subgroup, they looked at the thyroid um, autoimmunity as well. Um, and, and, it, and those with thyroid disorders at baseline were not predisposed to getting thyroid disorder as well. So um, that was uh, one, of our, one of the um, sessions that I saw on drug safety. And I think Jolie, you also had some um, stuff to share on that. I have some stuff on fingolimod and dimethylfumarate. So there was an Italian study by Nicola Bruschi who looked at real world data and I think it is important to look at the real world data because you can you get a much better feel for how patients take it in the real world with it without the frequent monitoring without the frequent visits and the reminders to take your medication and they were looking at their lymphopenia derived from either fingolimod or dimethyl fumarate and whether that was associated with a short-term treatment response or risk of infection which in these times is quite important yeah and um, they found, and they looked at it at six and 12 months, and they found the predictors for lymphopenia were being on a higher number of previous therapies and a lower baseline absolute lymphocyte count. Now, in these times of COVID-19 and the monitoring of patients, it might allow you to target who you relax the monitoring requirements in. Yeah. So for patients that are on have been on, this is their first line therapy, actually you're at a lower risk of developing that lymphopenia, um, which I think is in more important as time goes on and we don't know how long the reduced therapies, uh, the reduced yeah. monitoring might have to last. So if, if in a year's time we're still on this reduced monitoring, people might be getting a bit more worried about that. So we could target who needs to go to increase monitoring, which I think And is, is it with important. people with a lower baseline count, but still normal? Just yeah, on the still lower normal. side of normal. Yeah. Yeah. And so you're still getting that reduction, but that reduction is more like to more push significant because it's, yeah, yeah. it's at the lower end, which makes sense. Yeah. And so, and it's just interesting to see that this is in the real world without the frequent calls by your um, neurology team reminding you to take this, that, and the other without the free, more frequent monitoring that occurs in trials. So it was, yeah. it was interesting to see. Yeah. And you had some stuff that on fingolimod. So I went to, I, I saw quite an interesting short presentation, I thought, on HPV incidents on fingolimod. So it's, um, it was a single centre French retrospective study where they, where they went through their patients who, had, who were on fingolimod to see what, um, what the incidence of HPV um, development was. Um, and they identified 14 patients um, that had had fingolimod for a mean length of three years across the group um, that developed HPV um, and they stopped the drug in four patients which um, resulted in a worsening of their MS. Um, what was interesting was that the speaker couldn't tell me an exact number of fin total fingolimod patients so it's a bit difficult to to put that as a, as a percentage of their patients but she estimated between one and 200 which still makes it about seven to 14 percent risk developing HPV on fingolimod. Um, which is not something that I've ever really considered in our patient group. And I, and I know um, that um, the SPC talks about um, the risk of HPV. Um, so the conclusions of the study were basically that they felt HPV, the incidence was underestimated and underreported and that they, they, um, they um, hypothesized that we should vaccinate everybody 
um, before they go on to um, Ingolimor. So I don't know what you think about that, because the, the SPC does say HPV vaccination should be considered, is what it says. Yeah. Um, but we don't routinely look at that when we're screening our patients. I don't know if you do at your centre. No, well, no, we sort of just looked at it in the whole battery, but then the, the other worry will be when the other S1P inhibitors come out is that actually will that be, should be that be considered for them as well? And so mm -hmm. is it a class effect and should it be looked at? Or should we just be vaccinating everyone for everything? At but also getting accessibility of the vaccine in that patient group, because in a national vaccination programme, that's mm -hmm. not part of it, is it? That it's offered at a certain point in time and not, I'm not sure how available or easy it would be to get hold of and to fund in a, in a different patient group, but it's something to think about, certainly. And it's discussions in the future to be ha had with public health, um, because actually that normally vaccinations would come under them. Yeah. Actually, we need to consider the vaccine programme for all patients for all of these drugs, not only in MS, but in other biologic use. It does make you think about, you know, the... Um, how nice it would be to have a register. We always come back to this when we're talking about these types of things. Um, to be able to pick up the actual incidence of these sorts of things in our in our patient group, because um, it's not something that people would would um, necessarily know about unless you went looking for it, is it? And I think they went looking for it, but actually, should they go look for it in non MS patients, not on fingolimod? Yeah, that's too? true. So yeah. is the incidence actually higher anyway? And so. I don't, I don't no know. idea. Think. That's a good question. I don't know what the actual normal incidence is. Yeah. Right, but if you go and look for it, do you end up with a higher incidence? Yeah. Um, so a lot of the sessions that I saw were on ocrelizumab and the efficacy measurement as well as the sort of safety data. So Prof Amit Barrow uh, did a couple of sessions on and found that CSF B cells, T cells and chemokine 13 in, all in the CSF were reduced following ocrelizumab in primary progressive MS and relapsing MS. But it would be interesting to find out what ha this means for patients where the level didn't reduce. Does that mean that the, the drug isn't working? Is, are you more likely to get side effects if it does reduce like what does it actually mean mm. in terms of optimization for patients and obviously csf levels of all of those things are going to be difficult to monitor yeah. but he did find in a related presentation um the blood neurofilament levels were also reduced in primary progressive and relapsing ms with the greater instance of reduction in relapsing ms as expected but that's an interesting way of monitoring the efficacy of a drug and should we be doing that not just always relying on EDSS scores and things this is a biomarker that might mm. help in the future should that be what we're working towards as, as a blood biomarker that's more yeah. feasible CSF yeah. measurements is is not yeah. practical is it for our patients who are coming in um yeah, six like, infusions. Yeah. especially as we're yeah we're talking in other areas about keeping people out of hospital and not doing invasive things and stuff. But yeah, definitely interesting to have different ways of measuring um, the effectiveness of the treatment. And I think that's going to be important as we go forward, because we need to know these drugs are working for our patients and how, how can we monitor that effectively, but also quickly, because you don't want to know in three years' time. Yeah. That I think I think what's going to come out of the ocrelizumab hopefully um, data, the real world data, is a correlation between clinical effect and B cell suppression. Which, if people start looking at that, yeah, to see what 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 the what the what the um, there wasn't anything that I'm aware of at this in this conference around that. I think that's a one for the future conferences yeah. as to what that correlation is and the I you know the immunoglobulin drops in the real world for ocrelizumab. Yeah. Did you have anything else on ocrelizumab, or was that everything for that yeah so i so the only session that i had in my um um uh, sessions that i went to regarding oncolizumab was um a uh, poster from brighton where they actually just looked at their infusion related reactions on oncolizumab which as we've said it's really nice to have real world data to support um what we're told I and mean, it's quite timely that this this poster came out just you know a week or so before um the uh, SPC was updated to allow for shorter infusions, which it now is. Um, and this um, data from Brighton basically 
we confirmed that the in incidence of infusion related reactions are actually um, not that severe. So in their centre, they they had uh, twenty. They looked at twenty eight patients um, that they'd infused. Uh, as a side note, forty three of them had had no prior DMTs, and this was their first treatment. Uh, but what they looked at was the infusion related reactions as defined in the SPC, as in um, mild, continue the infusion, moderate, reduce the rate of the infusion, severe, stop the infusion. Um, and 82% had no or mild reaction, so that's reassuring. Um, and only 14% that um, had moderate or severe. Um, yeah, over half of people had no reaction at all. So we report that to patients when we're consenting them that infusion-related reactions are common in the definition of the SPC as a, as a common side effect. But I think um, it's reassuring to know that 80% of people in the real world don't have any reaction to speak of. And then that is you can reinforce that then by saying that we can now give it in two to two and a half hours to patients who've had it before, which I know given um, the difficulties that we've all got with capacity and infusing patients at the moment, it's nice to know that we can safely give it to them a bit quicker and get people in and out. Um, so that was all I had regarding oculizumab. So I think you also um, went to some sessions regarding, or a session regarding saponamod, is that right? Yeah, so Saponamod Prof Kapos presented the EXPAND extension study. So it's a five-year follow-up of the long and for the long-term efficacy. So at EAN they didn't present the safety data, but the efficacy that they found in the core study was sort of it carried on over five years, which I think is important to know because actually for secondary progressive MS, you definitely want to know that it's going to be a long-term efficacious product. And so that was nice. It was good to hear. Yeah. So, I mean, those were the sessions that we attended regarding MS drugs. I think just as an aside, there's one that I, um, that I, it was only a small um, poster on a case series, but I think it was, it was of note, which was CNS side effects relating to biologics used in, in other than MS. Okay. Um, and it was just pointing out, um, I mean, it, this is something we, we're all aware of, but it was, it was interesting to see a case series of drugs, including infliximab, adalumumab, golimumab, and etanercept. <laughs> I said that wrong, but you know what I mean. Um, um, and they were being used for a range of conditions such as Crohn's and psoriatic arth arthritis. Um, and there were cases of, there were multiple cases of CIS, optic neuritis, and then there was a case of new MS and worsening MS on those drugs. Um, and the conclusion just being that we need um, uh, we need uh, CNS monitoring of these patients on these drugs and prompt discontinuation. So we've had we've had that in our MDT patients that have been referred to us with MS that's been triggered by one of these other biologic treatments yeah. for other conditions. Um, and I think as time goes on, we might see more of those. Okay. Did we have anything else you wanted to discuss? No, I think that was everything. I think it was an interesting EAN. I think there is lots of benefits from it being virtual, but there's lots of negatives from not going into sessions you're being dragged into by a colleague who says, come with me to this. So <laughs> it, there's a swings and roundabouts, but yeah. um, it was definitely interesting to sit at home watching virtual sessions. Yeah, and I think there was, there was an opportunity to pick and choose things a bit that were a bit more relevant and take your time over them you know in a virtual setting which was good um yeah i definitely definitely got a lot out of it so it'd be interesting to see what happens going forward whether we have more of these conferences as a virtual experience yeah i think ean i know actrims and actrims are looking at it now to see what will happen for them yeah